Hiya lads and ladies, welcome to the third episode of the Saxon series. In this episode, we'll cover the darkest of eras in the history of Low Saxon, the 20th century, where the language went from spoken wide and far to heavily stigmatised, even discriminated against, and on the way out. And we'll discuss the response that elicited. Put on your wellies, because there's only one way forward, and that's through the deep end. Get ready! The last time we covered Low Saxon history up until the 20th century. That's right. Starting uh, way back in uh, the, the, the mists of prehistory mm-hmm. up to the Romantic period uh, of the uh, late 18th and 19th centuries. And then a lot of things change, obviously, in, in all respects in the 20th century, including for uh, regional languages. That's right. So we've had the rise and the downfall of Low Saxon. We had the rise, yeah, we had the heyday of Low Saxon basically in the late Middle Ages, right? Uh, related in large part to the, um, to the Hanseatic League, that trading network in northern Germany, in the Netherlands, especially the northeast, in uh, ports around that area, the Baltic and the North Sea, uh, as far south as cities like Cologne and, and Bruges and, and Ghent and uh, uh, Novgorod in, in Russia and Low Saxon functioning as a kind of lingua franca and deriving its importance from, from, that, uh, from that situation, from that identity. Right. And, and something we didn't remark on was that so clearly Low Saxon is not one unified language. It's just a collective name for for a dialect continuum where each group of speakers, a group being like a hamlet, village, town, or city, like a geographically joined community, speaking a slightly different form of Saxon now from town to town and then as the geographic uh, distance increases the differences in the language varieties also begin to increase until it, you get to a point where mutual understanding gets trickier. But there was a degree of um, standardization taking place in that Hanseatic period where the Lubeck, the, the way people spoke, in, in Lübeck, uh, spoke what they called Sassish, uh, Saxon. It, it's, it's been called that in documents. So, um, they, they probably also called it Dudish, like, uh, um, which is a term you still see in, in, in the current, uh, word Dutch, which means the, the people's speech right so forms of the word dutch a couple of centuries back did not necessarily mean present day dutch but meant some kind of continental germanic right and that can be seen in the german name for their language as well which is deutsch the germanic language is spoken in the americas like pennsylvania dutch which is a form of german yeah, and they and and they call uh, they call it Plauditsch. Yeah, um, but yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a different sort oh, okay. of sort of yeah. German over there. Um, I think, yeah. In, yeah, of course, in the in the state of Pennsylvania. Yeah, which isn't well. Of course, everything's related, but it isn't related uh, as such to Low Saxon. But it's it's a form of German. It's a form of not high high German, but. Uh, not from the Alpine regions, but from the Eiffel region, I think. No, you're you're entirely right. So Pennsylvania Dutch refers basically to a kind of German, not to Saxon. And then Plauditsch, spoken in you know, from Canada down to, I don't know, Bolivia, maybe further south, southern Brazil as well, is uh, is a kind of Saxon. And then Plauditsch, or Plauditsch, 
in uh, in uh, in in northern Germany. Dut, yeah. you know, Dut Dutch is 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 just the same word. Mm-hmm. In one case, it refers to Saxon. In the other, in the other case, it refers to Dutch. So, so Lübeck, that Hanseatic town on the north uh, coast of Germany, had a standardizing influence on the language, but it never quite, it never quite got to a point where there was a there was a unified language. And the Hanseatic League, that trading network, started to disintegrate, and to um, just, you know, it was being battered by the blows of competition from. From the Hollanders and from from other powers, uh, Southern Germany became became more economically and 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 culturally uh, prominent. So the, the the language you could say it 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 didn't it was this close to making it right, Martin, but it mm-hmm. but it didn't. That's right. And then it all went downhill just just you know at that crucial moment when. It hadn't quite become a standard language, but it was mm-hmm. sort of going there. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that, that's a great summary. There's, there's, there isn't much more I can add to that. Um, you know, the the early nineteenth century or the the early twentieth century really isn't my my forte. I I haven't really looked into that much, so I think this is your area of expertise. But. Um, yeah, what can be said is that I think somewhere in the early 1900s, the um, the school system changed in the Netherlands. I don't know about Germany, but of course we had uh, in, on the German side the German state was formed, like the uh, the Weimarana Republic. So uh, that was more of a centralized government, whereas we first had these uh, separate states like Prussia and. Hanover and and hundreds of little um, little areas that didn't really have much to do with each other, uh, apart from the trade, of course. Um, so there wasn't a need, as such, for a you know a language that you know everyone supposedly understood. Uh, but with the formation of these new states. Um, a new, a new, you know, national conscious conscience emerged, and people said, "Well, everybody needs to speak the same, and we're going to have one language of institution, or uh, one language of education, and that's going to be High German in Germany." And the same happened in the Netherlands. Well, Dutch had already been uh, a language of education, but um, the level of education or the you know the the mandatory nature of education uh, that was something new usually uh, the young people uh, in the rural areas of the Netherlands and, and Germany they uh, went to school only for a couple of years so they had the basics the very basics of uh, either Dutch writing or or high German writing um, but then uh, schooling improved so people had to stay in school longer and learn more and learn more Dutch. Sure. I mean, what you see, so the, the 19th century um, is characterized by a number of a big trends, right? Nationalism, the formation mm-hmm. of, of, um, of, of, of clearly delineated states with uh, a unifying uh, system uh, of law and, and language and what have you. Um, industrialism or industrialization rather romanticism Mm -hmm. romanticism drawing attention to things like the regional languages because they were considered romantic in the sense that they um, have a long tradition and 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 maybe uh, were a key to uh, uh, cultural traditions um, that that were quite old and could be studied and 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 and, and unlocked by um, by paying attention to what had formerly received very 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 little attention. So in that sense, Romanticism did a thing or two for uh, for local languages like uh, like Saxon on on non non national uh, languages. 
but only slightly, yes. Um, it, it, it gave it an, an impulse. Um, uh, although what I, what I was going to say was that the trends that you describe of, of in, more and more education, people stay in school longer, people don't just go to, initially they go to primary school, they have a couple of years of schooling, then you get secondary school, then well into the 20th century, second half, really, it becomes common for people to, to um, more and more common for people to go to university, for women as well, you know, tertiary education comes up. And all of this um, it benefits what are now the standard languages, what is now the standard language of each country. Um, and, 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 and takes away from, from regional languages that, that play no role in this, this expansion of, of education, of mass med- media, and et cetera. Now, Romanticism, um, helps the regional languages in the sense that they, uh, draw attention to them. So in the 19th century, you get these, uh, local dignitaries, like clergymen and, and uh, doctors and edu- educated people who who start uh, writing down texts in in regional types of speech that had never simply never or virtually never been written down uh, the exact way that people spoke, which was different from what was now the standard language, right? Um, but this rom- romanticism. Uh, also implied people beginning to write verse uh, and 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 uh, literature again in in Saxon. Um, in the Netherlands, there wasn't very much going on in this respect, but in Germany, actually, in the nineteenth century, you had a couple of big authors, and I'm actually realizing now that we're <laughs> we're going to talk about the twentieth century, but we're, we're kind of stuck. A bit before that, but um, or stuck. Maybe we're expanding on what led up to the twentieth century in order to eluc- elucidate right. better. Mm-hmm. You know what conditions were in place for the twentieth century to for things to develop there as they did. So exactly. So in Germany, you had a couple of authors like uh, Klaus Groth, Fritz Reuter, John Brinkmann. Uh, and, and several others who wrote these um, uh, poetry collections and fat novels in, 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 in the Saxon of their area. So for Klaus Groth, that was um, uh, uh, Schleswig Holstein. In, in, uh, in the case of Fritz Reuter, it was Mecklenburg for um, And And they were very successful. They drew a lot of attention to themselves. So they were read across the border. Like I've seen uh like early 20th century uh dutch uh, uh translations of of uh of these uh, saxon novels of reuter so, so they were big writers in, in the netherlands this literary scene was smaller mm-hmm. and was in in many cases uh, restricted to um to poetry and uh and, and regional novels, um, I, and fairly fairly rurally oriented as well. Uh, I can only remember one poem, I think, by uh, Beerns. Do you know him? Like in the nineteenth century, the the school, the headmaster of somewhere in the east of Twente. Um, he had this one um, one poem in Low Saxon, in the local Twente Low Saxon about a horse or something and that was it i i don't know his specific case but um for um for 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 um <clears throat> the subdivisions that have that exist in 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 saxon like uh Grenus and uh and Drenz, um historians literary historians have been now identified like the first piece written uh, or a lit- piece of a literary nature written in in that uh, variety of Saxon, like for Hrenus's, I believe it's a short play called Et and Fret, 
from 1790 something thereabouts and then you look at the province of Drenthe and Drens and the first things being written are of the oh, 1830s maybe thereabouts and it's it's very similar for each region um with with a slightly more important tradition in that respect for for uh, for the german areas right and there was one i, I now i remember there was one uh, set of stories from uh, van wienroan which is uh, from my hometown of riesen and he um, he wrote the Mitten Old Master Been Heard, which is like with the old master at the hearth, I believe. Um, and he had these short stories and short poems and, and wedding poems. Those were important as well. And uh, I think the wedding poems are um, one of the best preserved, um, yeah, types of writing that that exist to this day that you know that we can read and that have been preserved in for instance the Twinsett Talbank you were saying well can you expand on that a little so uh, what exactly is a wedding poem and in, in what uh, way are they still being produced and 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 read or um, uh, acted out what what exactly is this about um, mostly a wedding poem is um a sort of a, a rhyming uh, sort of description of the life of the the bride and the groom. And yeah, it's it's like a life up till up till the point where they get married. And um a sort of you know description of how they are as a person and how they work together and how they how we hope and, and dream that they will become very happy and have lots of children, that sort of thing. That sort of stuff, and they're often written. Like, how often are they written in the in the in the national standard language? How often are they written in Saxon? Um, I I I don't know exactly. I think they're they're if ever they are written, it's in Low Saxon, and so they're they're not in Dutch, because I remember my wedding, uh, my own mother wrote one of these wedding poems in Low Saxon. Uh, well, she never writes in Low Saxon, but now she did. And then she um, reads it out loud uh, you know, on a stage at the wedding, at the reception or something. Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I probably, I think I showed you once, I have um, an old written copy, uh, well, uh, written uh, sheet uh, with a wedding poem, which um, was either for my grandparents or... Of, or for people they knew, uh, probably a manuscript from the 40s, perhaps, also in, in uh, well, in North Ophelichels, Sterling Vardas. Uh, so which is another example of a wedding poem. Um, but that. So they're highly stylized forms of Low Saxon. Yes, yes. Which actually touches on an important thing to to realize that uh, if when a language makes it, and we just said that Saxon was doing very well for itself in the late Middle Ages with the impulse of the Hanseatic Trading League behind it, then that league started to decline in importance. Uh, the language was never quite standardized. It started to fragment into... Um, Loads of uh, of uh, of varieties, where with very limited self conscious among speakers of of a, lang- mm-hmm. a language of such as such, right? They they would say they spoke, they would call their language by the name of their town or region, and not look very much beyond that. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what you get when you uh, when you lose central government, right? When you lose your uh, Lübeck used to be the center, of course, that we just established that. Um, but um, when they lost their their power or even their you know their uh, range of influence over the rest, uh, the you know for it was highly fashionable to speak like the people from Lübeck first because that's where the center was, right? That's what everybody modeled their speech on. So uh, when that gradually loses influence, uh, 
it peters out and it, you know, it loses their, uh, you know, the central, you know, the central scope of things. So everybody just proceeds from there on out, right? And as Dutch is gradually getting more important, you see uh, a move towards more Dutch sort of speech. Um, of course, we there's there's a geographical element there as well because uh, you can see that the more Western varieties of Low Saxon start to sound more and more like Dutch of those days, and um, I can tell that um, there used to be a peat bog, uh, you know, sort of shielding Twente from the rest of the of the country, and. Uh, for a long time, that made us more inclined towards uh, Munster, which is in Westphalia. And that is why you still can hear traces of Westphalian uh, in our Low Saxon of today. Yeah. And and so when um, when the standard languages have, have become more and more clearly defined and are starting to be spoken by a, a growing number of people and uh, more and more people are sw- making the switch from their regional language to the standard language or speak them side by side for a generation or so and then people switch over entirely to the standard language which then becomes the only language aside from English you know which which they uh, are capable of uh, which they are um, have any knowledge of mm-hmm. um, now with with the very fast uh, uh, change of the 19th uh, and certainly the 20th century, you get the radio, you get uh, newspapers, you get inc- increasing literacy, uh, you get increasing mobility of people. And all of this, uh, television eventually, all of this is like harnessed in the service of the standard languages. Uh I need, I think I need I need to uh, interrupt you there because I think we've glossed over or, or brushed aside a very important period for Low Saxon, which is the French period. Don't you don't you think that is a very important part of our our speech because there's loads of French loans in Low Saxon. Yes, yeah, so you're referring to the Napoleonic period when France all of a sudden started to conquer. Uh, most of Europe and um, mm-hmm. and and French um, uh, you know, became the language of reference and uh, uh, just like people now look to English for uh, neologisms and loans and um, uh, it's 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 clearly by by a long shot the most prestigious uh, language around um, mm-hmm. in the uh, early 1800s and for a long time after that it was French until gradually it started mm-hmm. to be replaced by English in the 20th century. So how did French, uh, that, that like temporary strong influence and presence of French influence uh, Saxon and or Dutch? Mm-hmm. Well, you tell me. <laughs> uh, how did that happen? Um, no, no, what well, happened in the first place? What happened? Well, the French, uh, under Napoleonic rule, mm-hmm. Napoleontic rule, I'm not sure if that's the right word, um, they conquered uh, most of the Netherlands and parts of northern Germany as well. And um, I think they left a number of stadtholders, like city wardens, in place. They instated those uh, to look after the interests of the the local people and to make sure they are um, they know what the French are on about. And there's even mentioning of those people in the book I just mentioned, like uh, from Van Viroen. Um And for some reason, they got on quite well, I believe. And. Um, at least that's what I that's what I you know filter out from them what I what I read like they're they're borrowing words like uh, like very simple words and um, like for instance uh, the word for sidewalk or pavement uh, 
um, we we could say an estupe. But uh, locally here, people also call it a trottoir, um, which is clearly a, a French loan. And I don't know why, but um, they didn't feel like the... Um, it didn't feel especially highbrow or something. I'm not sure how that came about, but would be interesting. Would be interesting if people could explain more about that in the comment section. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm not the expert here, but um, I do notice that there are a lot of French influenced words still in our Low Saxon today. So uh, that would be interesting to find out. My favorite example, of course, being poule patate. My father used to tell us uh, about uh, the the pool of potato. We used to go walking through, uh, through the park here, and there's this cage full of exotic birds, and in there are a number of pool of potatoes, which, the, English word eludes me at the moment, but, um, it's it's a direct loan from French because I think we hadn't seen those birds before. Guinea, f- and they were imported. Guinea fowl. Guinea fowl. That's right. You're exactly right. Um, guinea fowl is, uh, in, in French, would be poule pintade, which means, uh, well, a, a, a dotted hen. And in proper Low Saxon, you'd say that's a stip hen. But nobody says that. They all say poule pintade or poule pintade. Or they all, all local varieties have sort of taken over the same word, but uh, applied their own local pronunciation rules to those loans. So you get a lot of variation within those French loans as well, which is very interesting to note. Um, but again, yeah, the, the French came and stayed for about 20 years. I'm not sure exactly how long they stayed, but uh, long enough to influence one generation. And yeah, then they sought it off back to France <laughs> and uh, well they left a legacy of certain words and we still use them to these day to this day uh yes and and um so um so clearly french left its imprint not just on saxon but on uh, on dutch and and german uh, uh, for very obvious reasons when 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 the french empire started to gobble up these territories even if temporarily, um, French left its imprint. And, uh, it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's quite noticeable in the vocabulary. And for some reason, it tends to stand out in Saxon where you have, uh, a, a fair number of, of French loans that you don't see in, 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 in Dutch, uh, or possibly in German. Um, you sort of sprung this on me. So I haven't got any examples like, I'm horrible at, improvising um but um <laughs> uh I, something that did occur to me that in certain cities um you have a phonetic uh, feature where the r um uh, uh for instance in uh to talk praten um sounds like praten mm-hmm. which in the netherlands is called brauer or mm-hmm. the verb brauen is pronouncing the R mm-hmm. like R, which is believed to have um, uh, to have come from French, um, because in the cities, you know, it was seen as uh, fashionable, and it was not adopted in the countryside. Um, so you have these city varieties of Saxon that, among other differences, stand out for for this uh, peculiar pronunciation of their R. Com- compared to the surrounding countryside where that did not penetrate. Um, it's very, which is very interesting because uh, as a side note, uh, where I live, the tip of the tongue R, like the R, is very much a sign of proficiency. And me as a child, I could not make that sound. So uh, they made me practice to sound more like the locals. <laughs> so I used to speak with this brau R, like, it's it's like the uh, the Northumbrian uh, uh, burr, which is a very interesting phenomenon happening in Northern England. Um, so, so yeah, 
I I could never say uh, yeah um, groot. So they may I I always said groot with a r, so which is your back in the throat. It's a throat r instead of a tongue tip r. So um, yeah, I know I know what you mean. It's usually uh, a, a sign of of you know more of a, of a city or um, uh, an urban an urban dialect. Sure, well, that's a little phonetic aside. Now zooming out a little bit again. Uh, so where a lot of the um, uh, developments you see in the nineteenth uh, and twentieth centuries um, p- provide an, uh, a boost to the standard languages because they're being uh, pretty much for for a large part exclusively uh, used for the new print media and uh, and then the radio and then television. Uh, the opposite happens for 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 Saxon and and clearly other regional languages as well because. A lot of what we're discussing, what we're saying about Saxon, happened just the same for Walloon and uh, and regional languages all over the place in you know in, in France and Italy and uh, and and uh, further afield. Um, yeah, and 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 before I interrupted you and we got on the sidetrack, you were um, skipping ahead towards the. The 1940s, 1950s. Am I right? Well, um, in, in terms of the, uh, the the mass media really beginning to burst upon us with, uh, especially with television, yeah, that takes us to to those uh, to to the 50s. Um, but what I was getting at is that, um, whereas now the standard languages have got everything going for them, what you see for uh, Saxon and other regional languages is that that they they're still um um now talking up to the mid 20th century pretty much universally spoken in in their respective areas um uh, you know by the people but um still the 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 areas for which the language is considered to be suitable become more and more constrained. So where, uh, say, Dutch or German are being used f- to write anything from, a, from, a, from some verse to a scientific paper, um, uh, Sa- Saxon um, uh, has been pushed into this romantic corner of, of, of um, describing old, Rituals and customs and the way of life of of country folk, um, the lives of farmers, um, the kind of literature that gets produced, um, it, it is plainly romantic. Now, obviously, in the uh, for the standard languages, you also have this romantic kind of theme in the nineteenth century. But then, um, in the twentieth century, people start to break out of this romantic mold. And explore new uh, literary styles, whereas Romanticism remains firmly lodged in place uh, for Saxon. And anyone who, to whom it occurs to write a poem or a a serialized story that may eventually get published in book format, uh, chances are that they are going to write about their childhood, the past. Uh, life in the countryside, life on the farm, uh, how, you know, the beautiful uh, reminiscence of, the, of their, of their village and, and their melancholy about having left it for the big city where the opportunities lay, uh, a general looking back. Um, and this restriction to ever smaller areas of the language is just a general theme for regional languages where Step by step, uh, its practical use becomes more constrained, and where it is used in speech or in writing, um, it, 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 it's like pushed into these reservations that are uh, well recognized and beyond which one does not venture. And, and in speech, um, what happens is that um, 
it, it's used for informal speech, informal conversations between people, you know, uh, who know each other, family members, or people who live in the same uh, village or town. Um, it's certainly not used in uh, in, edu in education, um, so it, it becomes it starts to become identified with these more uh, lowly, uh, less ambitious areas of life, and and once that identification starts to stick to the language, it's like mud being thrown at it, and it sort of accelerates its demise. I uh, give the floor back to you. For, us, for a hmm. minute. Thank you very much, Grace. Yes, you're quite right. Um, I I had the the the, the thought that uh, since it was it became more and more associated with farmers and farm work, um, and it was you know the dom domains of public life in which Low Saxon was deemed suitable. Uh, Became it became more and more you know restricted, uh, so um, with it narrowed down our idea of what it was suitable for. So um, I think the yeah well so it used to be a full fledged language right so um, suitable for for you know um, the barrister until the doctor until the farmer. And the um and you know, the parish priest, uh. But since those people, uh, had a certain idea that if you're educated, you can't speak Low Saxon, um, they didn't use it anymore. So we lost a huge load of our vocabulary, especially suited for those sort of professions, um. So. Our idea that it's exclusively uh, a form language comes from the fact that more people have abandoned it. And it's very funny to note that um, while in the east of the Netherlands it became more and more a form language, um, in the north they still associated with uh, fishermen. And... Uh, that undoubtedly has to do with the proximity of the North Sea and the uh, the Eastern Sea. If we're talking North, um, Northern Germany. What did I say? We're talking Northern Germany, like uh, East yes, Frisia yeah, and, sure. and, and uh, Holstein and those areas. Exactly. So it's, it's a bit of a clash of, um, of imagery there. And I always find it very funny to point out to people that uh, we live so far removed from the, the North Sea that we don't have any words for that and um, for fishing or f for, ex you know, of course we do have words for fishing, um, but not in the sense that we have a jargon for it, while as, whereas we have retained a huge, you know, vocabulary, um, especially suited for farm life and, you know, the equipment and the, 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 the farming tools, and uh, since so many people abandoned the language, those words were forgotten. Um, and of course, yeah, uh, you mentioned shortly, uh, uh, briefly, you mentioned the media. Um, I don't know at what point in time we are at the moment. Are we? Have we passed the nineteen forties yet? Well, uh, if you want to talk about specifically the the uh, impact of the media on or the mass media on uh, regional languages, you would want to point out that newspapers were being started up as early as the uh, closing stage of the of the seventeen hundreds, uh, whereas radio didn't didn't come along until the early 20th century and then television didn't really get going until the 50s, 60s. Um, so um, I would say that the um, for a long time the mass media were, um, although they were making uh, more and more people familiar with 
with the standard language of of their of the country they were living in. Um, they 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 weren't. They were probably changing in subtle manners uh, regional speech, you know, because of the uh, prestigious examples that were provided to people, and people started being exposed to more and more. For a long time, that didn't change matters very much until in the second half of the twentieth century, really the post-war period. Um, right. You get television, and you get. Uh, this Massive uh, expansion of print media, magazines uh, that people start reading, you know, weeklies mm-hmm. and monthlies and, and dailies, uh, all of them, all of them written in in the standard language in Dutch or in in, in German, and and then exclusively, right? Yes, and and, and television, um, like television becomes uh, a. a like a huge uh, 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 f- focal point of diffusion of of the standard language, and uh, you can listen to it until your ears bleed, but you're not going to hear um, Saxon uh, uh, on on Dutch television. It's slightly different now for Germany because the NDR, the Norddeutsche Rundfunk. Um, which is, uh, I guess, based in in Niedersachsen. Don't mm-hmm. know if it takes in uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. No, because they have the uh, WD uh, W West West Deutsche Rundfunk. So they broadcast um, some, you know, limited and modest content in in Pladuch, uh, mm-hmm. in the Low Saxon of of Northern Germany, but. In the Netherlands, it's, you don't even get that. So television content is produced in Dutch, standard Dutch, aside, of course, from foreign content, a lot of English and, and French, and that gets subtitled in our case. But the local languages, by and large, are uh, invisible and uh, inaudible. But s- mm-hmm. s- there's something that goes a step further than 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 that the fact that the languages the regional languages not even by regional media that started coming up also in the a bit later in the 80s they didn't uh, adopt the local languages as a vehicle for the diffusion of news and 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 content and talk shows and uh mm-hmm. well they did up to a point and, and local radio did 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 have uh, saxon material but in the end you can say that the the standard language won out. Uh, certain, certainly mm-hmm. today, if you listen to the uh, the radio and television for the province of, say, well, any province really. Uh, but uh, well, uh, wouldn't you wouldn't you say that apart from the um, the general negative attitude towards anything uh, non-standard uh, from the people that held the reins? Um, it had something to do with the first the the the, the lacking quality of uh, broadcasting uh, equipment uh, in the early forties and fifties. Of course, they started off experimenting with these things, and um, well, we we all re- we all know recordings of those days, and um, they weren't very clear yet, and they weren't very um, you know as as clear as this podcast will be. <laughs> if that is a correct standard <laughs> uh but um yeah don't you think that um because uh they kept in mind that the you know the signal would be less well uh, would be less clear that they'd you know say speak clearly and we need to speak enunciate very properly and and and, and so so uh and um we have to do it in a way that uh, en- anybody will understand. And, of course, that anybody will understand. Uh, the only language that anybody will understand is Standard Dutch. So that's how that came about. And, uh, of course, the uh, the centre of media, the media centre in the Netherlands is in the uh, Hoi, the, the Hilversum area, which is slightly southeast of Amsterdam, I believe. 
and um yeah and they of course pushed their own dialect which is the Roy dialect yes well so this um um this um so in a, in a sense it is a non-standard or it is it's all regional just not our region yeah well the drive to speak the standard language and to uh, try as best you can to ignore the regional language of your own area um i think is everything to do with the prestige attached to the standard language and not so much to uh technology and and fears about the um you know uh supposed superior enunciatory qualities of the standard language right yeah of course but um yeah that might be a, uh, one of the underlying issues but um of course the prestige of the language um played a huge part and wh- what i wanted to say about this is that so the saxon does not get used to produce media content it doesn't get used in schools but uh it, it goes a step beyond that because uh, on television as i was growing up and watching dutch television in the 80s and 90s i don't remember a single program dedicated to the existence of a a language like low saxon or whatever name they wanted to give it back at the t- in, in in the day um or for that matter to, to frisian so you get documentaries and programs on, with cultural content that describe uh you know, festivities and folkloric uh phenomena um but 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 the language is not just saxon but also other regional languages like limburgian is is as though they don't exist they exist for for people uh, in local communities to speak to each other and to uh quickly switch to standard to stand the standard language as soon as anybody comes within earshot who is not their neighbor or their relative um so it's very much under the radar and hidden uh it doesn't get talked about it doesn't get taught in schools now clearly it doesn't get taught because the general idea is that anything that is not the standard language needs to just quietly fall by the wayside and start disappearing because it is it is impeding progress but even mm-hmm. as a cultural phenomenon like okay so we this it's these it's the 80s it's the 90s um there's a general belief that only the standard language is of any value um but there is also recognition that many people and especially uh, older segments of the population very generally still speak very different regional languages um with varying degrees of mutual intelligibility to the standard language certainly for germany with like plattdeutsch low german low, low saxon is, is 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 very different from from high german um and and uh, not not just um uh mutually intelligible uh, unless you begin to actually study it um even as 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 uh, in in terms of a recognition of okay this is it we have a biglossal situation uh and as a c- cultural phenomenon it, it it has its you know it just exists so you would want to pay attention to it i think it's due to the shame and stigma attached to uh regional non-standard local varieties of speech that that national media and to a large extent even the regional media pay zero attention to anything that is going on uh in and around saxon uh not just not just the fact that it's being still very widely spoken but also the literature being produced in it it is so none of that exists none of that gets any you know uh uh it doesn't get given its due and and that's because it's like people are ashamed to bring it up either because they are really uh convinced of the inferiority of regional languages or they sort of recognize that it's a shame that certain things are 
dying out, but they intuit that if they touch it, then that's like uh, it's like prodding a, a wound. Like it, it's it's best just covered up a bit and and left there, and then it will just if we look we look away long enough, it will go away. Mm-hmm. It will go away, and mm-hmm. all we will have left is just standard Dutch and. In, in today's world, of course, standard uh, English as well. Uh, uh, okay, I'll stop droning. But do you get what I'm? <laughs> <laughs> That's good to, to hear your 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 thoughts on that. Um, but at the same time, uh, this 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 time you're speaking about, like the you know the the seventies and the eighties, those were the the time when something happened, right? Because we need to we need to do something, right? Well, yes, I mean, and it isn't as if it, I'm sorry to to interrupt again, but um, it isn't as if it, as if there isn't done anything in the language, but it's just not picked up by the national media or the regional media even because uh, there's extensive writing going on. There's there's poetry. There's uh, literature being written even in the 1950s and 60s. I think the the first. The first dictionary of my local variety was written in 1959. The nationally renowned uh, writer Belcampo, he wrote like like travel travel accounts and you know the the wondrous travel of Belcampo through Europe. I think that's the translation of it. So there were quite a few individuals. So it wasn't anything you know coordinated, but there were quite a few individuals who still believe that this language is beautiful and worth preserving and worth creating in so um yeah well they set they set up their organizations uh of, right. of which the, i was i was getting there yeah, yeah. <laughs> there there are quite a few um I, what, do you want to carry on a bit about these uh, organized structures that are springing up so yes there are s- certain groups springing up that uh, one of the most uh, I'm I'm most familiar with is the Kring for the Twenty Sprake. Meaning? Meaning that it's a circle uh, for the preservation of the Twins language. And here you can clearly see that it's focused on one dialect in particular. And most of these groups of dialects, these dialect preservation groups and cultural preservation groups, they focus on their their own dialect exclusively. And anything beyond that uh well they are somewhat fami- uh, somewhat aware that these exist but they don't want anything to do with it because it sounds different and it's well i wouldn't say less in worth but just not worth considering so you have the kring for the twenty sprake you have i think the staring institute which was named after a, a, a man from the achterhoek region who wrote uh, in uh, the local variety, I think in the in Groningen in Grun, they have their own yeah sort of organization that uh, you know is concerned about preserving the Groningen dialect, and uh, you have the Stelling waar we schrijven rond springing up. So there's quite a lot of activity going on, and I think in the 1970s, uh, that's where we're headed. In the 1970s. 1975, somewhere in the Achterhoek, you know, knocking over everything we've ever known, there's this one group who smashes all everything there is to know what we should do in the Netherlands, right? They, um, there were pop groups, of course, uh, springing up, and they were all singing in this, well, strange sort of idea of what English should be, like Dunglish. Um, they were producing disco songs in English and they were you know copying everything that was done in the United States and uh, any, anything the Brits did we had to do as well and in our variety of English but there was one group from the Achterhoek which was called Normal and that name was chosen deliberately because what is normal what is normal and they decided that this is enough we're going to do things differently. We're not going to, you know, slavishly follow the masses. We're going to make rock music in our own language, in their local variety of low Saxon. This was like, you know, like a bomb went off. 
because this changed everything. They made national headlines and they, well, it was the first, their song Ur und Hart was the first, first low Saxon song that made it to the national hit lists and I think land, even landed in, at, at, at first place, right? At first in the top spot. So um, they opened up a whole world of, you know, renewed recognition and appreciation for their yeah, local culture. Right. Uh, I want to touch on two areas. So um, the music scene, what you're referring to, something that gets going in the 70s, 80s, is referred to in the Netherlands as the dialect renaissance, where um, uh, uh, groups and, and singers uh, start making use of of the local language rather than either English or 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 the the nationwide language. Um, you see this both in the Netherlands and in Germany um, with artists like Normal, as you mentioned, or singer songwriters like Ada Stoll in Groningen, Hannes Wader in North Germany, and Knut Kiesewetter also in in North Germany. And Torfrock. I think they're roughly around the same time when Normal springs up. You get Torfrock in the north of Germany. And they, they're a rock group as well. And they sing in lo- the local Low Saxon variety of, I think, East Frisia. But I'm not entirely sure there. Yeah, you get the Groningers group Turf, Turf, who uh, got going very early, around the same time as Normal, I believe. So... Like it's a, it's a it's like a new avenue of expression uh, for the local language is pop music, and and the lyrics being uh, written and sung in Saxon, and for Normal, the reason they were so drew so much attention to them is that not only did they sing in 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 their Achterhof Low Saxon, but they um, made a, a case for the emancipation of the image of farmers. So after the Second World War, all of the um, emphasis had been on uh, reconstruction, urbanization, industrialization, uh, uh, modernization, uh, uh, the development of technology, uh, uh, moving from the countryside to the city where where the jobs were, and, and farmers... Where you know, if you go several decades back, just about everyone everybody was a farmer, so there was nothing special or unusual about uh, being a farmer. But now farmers sort of started to be associated with the, the backwards life. Uh, it started to be made fun of. Like when I when I grew up in the eighties, nineties, one of the worst things you you get uh, tarred with was to be called a boer, a, a farmer, doma boer. Stupid farmer, dumb farmer, which is, is very different in South Africa, where Bura refers to the Afrikaners and is a matter of pride. But in the Netherlands, to be to be to be called a Boer is to be called backwards and to uh, speak unintelligible gibberish and to not be very educated. And now Normal very much celebrated uh, the farming life and 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 countryside uh, living and celebration and living in the here and now and enjoying life and not making things more complicated than they were, uh, not, not not being too uh, highfalutin and fancy, uh, really living up to this um, Dutch uh, motto of just act normal, that's, that's crazy enough as it is. Well, that's doubly the case for people in the eastern countryside in, in the Saxon areas who are not inclined at all to, to stand out or to, uh, to be exaggeratedly ambitious, which of course doesn't help in terms of defending their own culture and, and language because they're very inclined to say, okay, we'll take a step back and um, ha- hand over to the powers that be. And, but but uh, yeah. In any case, uh, uh, you have uh, these new forms of, ex- of expression for the language, like these musical groups, and also going back a bit. So 
literature literature had been being produced in in Saxon through the nineteenth centuries, nineteenth and twentieth centuries, but had sort of got stuck in the groove of Romanticism f- for the most part, whereas the standard languages developed from there and uh, went through a plethora of literary styles. Uh, back in the, on the Saxon scene, as late as the, well, still today, for a lot of people using the language to write in, it's about reminiscing about the past, uh, uh, glorifying country life, or uh, waxing lyrical about one's village. So in the 70s, you get, you get a, a rebellion against that, where uh, specifically in the province of Drenthe, uh, a couple of youngsters from the baby boomer generation who grew up in the 50s and 60s and still spoke Saxon as their mother tongue, they, uh, they wanted to see the emancipation, just what Normal wanted for uh, the, the farmer lifestyle and a recognition of the uh, economic importance of of of, uh, of of farmers for the country obviously they wanted for literature uh a complete destruction of taboos because you couldn't write about sex or subjects like homosexuality that had taboos that had been assaulted uh for several decades in the standard languages but that, that were still quite firmly in place for for dialect writing, as it's, it was often called. And they set up a new magazine here in Drenthe um, called Root, which uh, uh, appears, I uh, don't know if it's always appeared, well, it's appeared four, five, six times a year on average, uh, began to appear in, in uh, I think, 79, off the top of my head, and and still exists and is... Uh, pretty much the only true blue literary Saxon magazine still around. Uh, several others having a, a, a arisen and then gone on for a while and, and bitten the dust again. Uh, so you, you do get a, a, a new appreciation as as the uh, 20th century starts to grow old and hoary and creaky and and uh, the 21st century is impatient to take over uh, with the dialect renaissance you get a new appreciation for at least the cultural value of saxon right which does not quite mean that these defenders of the cultural value and cultural modes of expression in literature in in music and what have you of the regional language necessarily believe that the language has much of a future or a a right to exist beyond this cultural uh, stockade. Absolutely, yeah. That's that's always um, yeah, a bit strange in my opinion, because uh, I'm of the firm belief that uh, language carries everything. But yeah, there are loads of people who love low Saxon culture, but loathe the low Saxon language. They they engage in all kinds of cultural activities like, you know, uh, wearing old, um, yeah, the drachten garments from the 18th century, keeping certain crafts alive like clog making or stuff like that. But at the same time, when you ask them, do you teach your children to speak Low Saxon? Well, the thought hasn't even crossed their mind. Of course not. So there, a lot of emphasis is being put on, I mean, in of course, we're we're approaching the nineties here and the eighties and the nineties where we both grew up. Um, so there's lots of emphasis on on cultural things, but not so much on preserving the language. Or at least, um, I mentioned one of these uh, groups before. I've I've been to these uh, these nights, these preservation group uh, dialect nights, where people recite poems and 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 tell each other stories. Someone occasionally sings a song. Uh, but no effort is being made to compile some sort of curriculum for making people learn this language. By, by, by nights, you don't mean they party through the night. You mean they meet, they don't party meet up the in the early evening and they're generally of a more advanced age, aren't they? They're, that's right. The, the average age ranges between 60 and 80 years old. Yeah, so 
And those generations seem to not be able to fathom that um, there are generations now who haven't been brought up in this language and uh, don't hear it at home. So we need to treat this language as a separate language, you know, create course material from scratch, like very basic stuff, like like um, uh, simple grammatical things, like um, how do you parse this verb or how do you conjugate it, right? How do you, how do you speak this language? Where do you start? How do you pronounce it? What happens? How do you, how do you morph it? You know, how do you uh, conjugate it? What are its, ex- its expressions? So, yeah, what you see is that um, many of these dialect knights, they're focused on, you know, reminiscing, which you established earlier. As strongly as people feel that this language should be preserved, they don't know how to do it. Yes, yeah, so looking back becomes a central theme when it comes to appreciation at all of Saxon. So it has a lot of detractors that really believe the language ought to disappear uh, because it is impeding the acquisition, the proper acquisition of the standard language, uh, which we as activists of some stripe or other or proponents uh, of the preservation and continued use of Saxon would say, well, as long as you teach languages consistently and s- separate one language f- from the other, then just like you can learn, uh, say, Dutch and German or, uh, or German and English, you can learn a national language and a regional language. Or just like you can learn your local variety of Norwegian and uh, more standard New Norsk or Bogmo Norwegian, or just like in Switzerland, you can speak Switzerdutz, which is a thriving language, uh, rather different from, from standard German, as well as have a perfect mastery of, of, of standard German. And no one can accuse the Swiss of being uh, like a failed society, hmm. where people you know, are groping about in the dark because they haven't learned to speak properly. We have these examples of of how it's possible to to carry to carry on in the modern era if people want to speaking a local a local language uh, that doesn't span the whole national territory like in Spain and Galician and Catalan and Basque as well as the national language that unites the whole country and so ends our third episode on the darkest of eras in the history of Low Saxon yet. Next up is that new age that was introduced by the internet revolution. A new era in which the old ways in which we communicated or got our news, as well as our sense of fashion, got completely upturned. And new ways gained traction and shaped how we feel about this language today. The 21st century. But before we get round to it, we'd be delighted if you'd take a moment and gave us a thumbs up and a share. For now, Rothaar. <laughs>